Hello and welcome to Just Films and That. This is the podcast that celebrates films we reckon might be underrated or underseen. I'm your host for this week, Alice Oliver. With me, as always, is Josh Hallam, and it was his turn to pick the film this week, and he went with The Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1996. So let's get to it. So then, Josh, before we get stuck into this week's film, do you want to tell our lovely listeners at home all about our Patreon? Yes, just a quick note for you guys at home. If you're looking to get a little bit of extra stuff from us, access to episodes a day early, bonus content, things like that, head on over to patreon.com forward slash just films and that, uh, and you'll find a few bits over there. I'll put a link to it in the episode description as well. Uh, There's a few tiers on there. They start from a pound a month and all tiers include access to an ep- um, to episodes a day early uh, and extended episodes as well so hopefully you can head on over there uh, and any support you give us will be massively appreciated anyway back to you alice thank you very much josh and so to this week's film so it's the hunchback of notre dame from 1996 so spoiler warning listeners if you haven't seen it yet mm. so josh do tell us what is the film about and why did you pick it uh, well, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Do you know what? What's it about? It's about the bell ringer who is um, who who w- lives in in Notre Dame and rings the bells, and he's the Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's a very very famous story. I don't think we need to go into it any uh, anymore. <laughs> this is the same old story that we've probably that, that has been adapted many many times, but it's got a Disney flavour to it in that it's a musical um, and then some other sort of you know formulate Disney things in there as well. Uh, why did I pick this one? A few reasons. So first of all, we hadn't done a musical for a while. Mm-hmm. We hadn't done an animation for a while, mm-hmm. um, so that was on there. I picked this in terms of the format of the podcast. I picked this because I think it's underseen and underrated. Ooh, double whammy, we Indeed. like that. So, so I've seen the ratings, and I think they're a tad underrated. It's not okay. criminal, it's nothing mm-hmm. massive, but I think that it's underrated in a similar way that I thought Hercules was underrated way okay. back when we did that, and I think yeah. that... People aren't grouping this with other films that are considered to be the Disney classics, the the you know the the pillars of the Disney sort of catalog. You know your your Beauty and the Beast, your Little Mermaids, your um your Aladdin's, your Lion the Kings, Lion or, Kings. Yeah, yeah, or, all that yeah. sort of stuff. And I and I think similar to Hercules that it should be. I also think it's underseen in that I think it did pretty well when it came out because mm-hmm. because Disney films do well when they when they come out depending on usually whether well, you you know they normally do <laughs> and uh, I don't think though that people are seeking it out now. Mm-hmm. I think people now are going back to you know our generations now great deal of us have children and I think a great deal of them are showing them the Lion King and the Little Mermaid. I don't think people are showing their kids the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I do think there's a, probably a reason for that as well as the fact that it, I just still think it's underseen but we'll come on to that. Um, anyway I'm intrigued. I didn't, I really wanted to ask you this one but I didn't ask you. Have you seen this one before? Because I feel like you must have done but also wouldn't be surprised if you haven't. I hadn't seen this one before. Wow. Yeah, and and that's weird, isn't it? I remember seeing it like heaps, seeing the trailer heaps and heaps when I was a kid, obviously, you know, because we had loads of Disney VHSs. uh, So it would have been at the beginning of those. But no, it was just never one. We never got it. I never saw it. And I'd never thought to watch it of my own accord. So I was very happy when you picked it because no, I hadn't seen it. And I thought, well, that's weird that I haven't seen it Mm. because I did enjoy Disney films as a child, still do now. Mm. Uh, so yes, I was very excited so to I, watch I, this one. Because I, I cannot put my finger on what you'll think of this. Because mm-hmm. part of me thinks you'll you will you will really like it because it's quite dramatic, it's quite gothic. Some of the music is a little bit similar to like Evita. In the, in, in in it's quite operatic in places. There, it is certainly operatic, and there's a lot of like orchestral kind of yeah, classical score going but on. But also, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if you watched this and thought. Not for me. Do you know what I mean? So go on, go on. What did you think? What did you think? So, Josh, I had a very lukewarm reaction. Really? To this lukewarm. film. Yeah, it was, I, there were, there were elements of it that I really enjoyed and really mm. appreciated. But as a whole, it just didn't kind of, it didn't hit me. Like it didn't whack me in the same way that maybe some other Disney films or other children's films mm. have done. And I'm not even 100% sure 
why, but maybe it will come up as we have the conversation and we can assess sort of like what was good. What you can was sort bad, of we can look at like why you're we can look at why you're wrong, yes, can't we? So, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll change my mind and you'll get me super jazzed about no, it. No, you know, it, it happens. It happens. Of course, of course. So let's start with you though. You chose okay. this film. Tell me a bit about your relationship with this film and what are some of the things that you love about it. Yeah, so I saw it, I saw it at the cinema. I've seen it a few times. I haven't seen it in a while, mm-hmm. and I actually put this on my list when you. I think I put it on my list when you picked a Vita. Oh, wow, I, that's, started, that, that is interesting. I started thinking yeah. about different musicals that I liked. Mm. And this is one of them that sort of goes a little bit against the grain of what I do like. Because I've said in the past that for me, Evita, I find it a little bit slow. And mm-hmm. I don't like, you. I suppose, I, I can't really put my finger on what I mean by it, but I don't really like what you consider your big ballad-driven musicals, Evita. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not that bothered on like Les Mis and things mm-hmm. like that. Jesus Christ Superstar, all these ones. Whereas I do quite like, you know, I've, I mentioned it before, like, Hairspray, Hercules was one and stuff like that. And this isn't based on a musical, obviously. It's not, It's I'm not going to talk about it as a musical. It's just there is music in it. So it is, a, you know, it's an animation music. It's a Disney film. If it's got a genre, it's that. Mm-hmm. It's what you expect mm-hmm. from a Disney film. But generally speaking, overall, I have a lot of affection for this film. I really, I really like it. I find it to be very dramatic and very emotive it's very much a disney film in that it's adhering to the formula that we all know of a story you know quite a fairy tale element style style story um with songs in it you know there's there's you know an upbeat song there's more dramatic song there's a villain song all that sort of thing you know quippy sidekicks big villain all that sort of thing historic setting but also it's it's a little bit different in places as well in that it's quite dark it's quite mm-hmm. a dark disney film and i'd never really thought how dark it was until i watched it this time round which is why i also wonder if people aren't showing it to their kids now Mm, so we'll right. come we'll come back to that a little bit later. Quasimodo as a character in his journey, really, really loved. There's something about that whole thing, his whole arc of just wanting to be loved. Mm-hmm. Like there's no, you know, there's he, he is a little bit different in, you know, in in that he he's not your typical Disney leading man. There is a typical Disney leading man in it, but he's mm-hmm. very much a secondary character. He's not Quasimodo, who who is the main character. It's also quite forward thinking in its representation, especially for 1996, because obviously Quasimodo is differently abled and he's that he's the main character, but you've also got lots of different representation of race in there because there's a whole plot line about Romani gypsies. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, it's set in France. So there's French people in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so, so yeah, generally speaking, that's what I like about it. I've got a few things to say about the sort of, the look, the sound, the music, and a few other bits as well. What do you want to hear? Do you want to hear me, or shall I come back to you? What you think, generally speaking? What do I think, generally speaking? So I like, I do like the themes and the messages that are explored in this one, like things around appearances, judgment, acceptance, expectation, kindness, shame, and guilt, and so much more. Even than that, there is so much going on in this, and it was all really, it was a really enjoyable and positive experience. I thought. So I think Esmeralda is fabulous, and especially Mm. in terms of Disney princesses. So I think she does stand out from the lot. So she's very cool, charismatic, and self-reliant. She's also quite sexy, which I don't think I've ever really seen in a Disney film. But it's the way she dances so confidently and gets the crowd going. So it was interesting to see a Disney princess be desirable in that sort of way, whereas usually they're desirable because, you know, they're very reserved and Mm. sweet and prim and proper and would make a nice, obedient wife. And a lot of the time, the whole sort of law about them is that they're a virgin and pure and all this nonsense yeah. and you know obsessed with finding a husband and esmeralda just is isn't that not any what, of all, that that's, you're not like you're not like women aren't not not, not all of us josh is it not, not all of us some some <laughs> and you know what that's totally up to them is, that's cool you, you are you're spot on there because it's actually part of the plot Mm-hmm. So, so it is a, it is you know, it's it's actually one again because it's quite dark and adult, thematically adult in places. It's quite a horny film. Well, like like the, Frollo's whole thing is, is that yeah. he doesn't like Esmeralda because mm-hmm. it never says it, but he's attracted to her, so he, he feels like she's. Her. He, he wants to bang her. He bad, wants to bang yeah. her. Listen. And she is very sexy, but the yeah. whole thing is he's a man of God. He's driven. He's, he's considers <laughs> yeah. himself to be very moralistic and considers, considers himself to be a pinnacle of, you know, leadership and strength and morals and all that sort of stuff. And he wants to bang Esmeralda. And obviously, the way he sees it, 
is that she's it's witchcraft. She's bewitched him. She's it's, it's her it's, fault. It's she's her done fault. a spell on him. And, That's and it what is, she's you know. Done. And I think I think I think cards on the table. It is the yeah. real villain of this film is Esmeralda. <laughs> no, but no, you're absolutely right. She is she is a little bit different. I suppose if you had to say she was most similar to someone. Maybe Jasmine from Aladdin, but she is sort of stands alone a little bit because she's not I, even I really the princess. Yeah. She, you know, she's not no, really not a princess, princess is she? No, and I sorry, I just use that as kind of no, like it's the, it's the, for the leading. But it is the catch because also Disney a Disney film, princess yeah. doesn't mean you are a princess. It, yeah. It's just the term for it's usually the term for leading Disney female character, isn't it? Yeah, I think the, the thing, because it's rooted, if you think about the really early ones, so like Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella. Snow White, Cinderella, yeah. I think they literally, they do become princesses because that is the dream of every young girl, apparently. Yeah. But with Esmeralda, it was just a completely different exploration into like femininity and sexuality that you just, I haven't seen, I don't think, in any other Disney film. So I was very impressed with that and very happy about that. And I thought she was a fantastic character. So the fact that so much of the film is set on top of a tower means that a lot of the animated images and scenes are of these aerial views of the city. And you get these wonderful shots of the sky and these huge wides of the horizon. So visually, it's really impressive. And things like you've touched on, like the Gothic architecture and all that. Mm. I think visually it was really, really impressive. I thought it was quite funny at times as well. And there was some really strong wordplay in there. And I think the script in general is pretty good and quite sophisticated. So our our not, our leading man who is not Quasimodo. So is it Phoebus? Phoebus. 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 Yeah. And his horse is called Achilles, Achilles. And he tells the horse <laughs> yeah. to heal. Yep. So he says, Achilles heal. Oh, nice, funny, nice little One for the mums and dads there. there. Yes, exactly. We all learned something there. With you saying it's funny, and this might come up later on, so if it does, please do say so. But I'm interested to know, what did you think of the gargoyles? Oh, so I did have a point about the gargoyles and it was my next point. So that is fantastic oh. timing from you, Josh. So in terms of like funny and that, I thought it was they were very child friendly. Mm. Uh, so, you know, they weren't making me laugh out loud or anything. But what I did enjoy about them is that for me, it's, and this might be really clear to you as someone who's already a fan of the film, but for me, it's really strongly implied that them speaking is completely in Quasimodo's head. Like so, he is yeah. imagining that. That is something that he has made up to deal with the isolation yeah, and the, the loneliness his own and the, the trauma of living in that tower on his own because they don't speak to anyone else, I don't think. No. Nope. And any time. They freeze any time. Yeah, freeze any Exactly, anytime like Andy's in. toys, right? So I was like, they're definitely in his head. I was saying to Wally, it's like, those gargoyles are definitely only in his head. And he was it like, depends. no, I don't think so. <laughs> it depends how far you want to extrapolate that out. So, so, the, so okay. the reason I brought them up is the first thing is one of the criticisms of this film is that they don't fit the film. And I was okay. reading that whilst I was watching it and I just thought, for me, that's nonsense because if they're not mm. in it, there is no levity mm -hmm. in this film. It's it's far too bleak with this film. The only little <laughs> bit of comedy, the only other little bit of comedy you have apart from the Gargoyles is, like you say, a little bit of Phoebus being a bit quippy and Jarley, which is um, Esmeralda's goat. goat. Yeah, he's but cute. without that, that's not really enough. So I think you do need them in there because, you know, also... Mm -hmm. You go. You gotta sell cereal and toys and all that sort of stuff. But any anyway, um, do I think they're in his head? I used to think they were, but in the film, and this is why I say it depends how far you want to go with it because they do interact with other characters in that they help him defend the church at the end. So they spit at. Um... They spit at one of them. Doesn't one of them chew something and spit it like machine gun fire at the guards? Right. But that's not mm. to say that that's not also in Quasimodo's head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, and I think I think the the answer is 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 whatever you want it to be. Yeah, because the you know if you want to Disneyfy it, then magic talking gargoyles. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it more like probably the tone of say the original Victor Hugo novel, they're definitely in his head mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's the sort of tone of the novel. So a few other bits for me as well. So just to touch on what you said there, the look of it, it does look amazing, and I remember I remember it being struck by how it looked even just from the trailer when I remember, I remember seeing it like you say at the start of a VHS tape or something like that way way back in the day it's quite striking it's set in 14th in, in the 1400s in Paris so there is a general look about that film which it does it does it looks good I think it looks it looks really really good when I was mm -hmm. a kid it made me think that Notre Dame was enormous mm -hmm. like in like to the point where I think I used to think that the towers of Notre Dame the famous towers were like the size of the Eiffel Tower yeah yeah, but yeah. if you've ever been, 
it's a, you know it's a it's bit it's not small it's not a small church but it's not even it's not even say the size of like some, I don't even think it's any bigger than say St Paul's in London or the Anglican Cathedral in Liverpool or anything like that. It's a very beautiful church. Obviously, it's been going through restoration works because it was burnt down, wasn't it, a couple of years ago? I don't know where that's up to, but I genuinely thought this it was enormous, like the mm-hmm. size, like like the size of like uh, the Eiffel Tower or something like that. So they do some good things with scale, particularly to do with like him ringing the bells and stuff like that. Um, so one one thing I wanted to ask you about: what did you think of the music? Ah, so, so that's so that's the first point in my dislikes. Ooh, right, so okay. Would you like me to go into it now? No, or let's, should we take um, a little yeah, musical um, break? <laughs> no, let's um, let's carry on with some other likes. Then, what else have you got in your likes? And we'll come back to the music because it's actually in my likes. So I'll, I will counteract your point with that rather than rather than saying it now. What else have you got? Uh, that was the last of my likes, actually. The the debate okay. about whether the gargoyles are are kind of in his head or not. Mm. Uh, so, what are some of the final things from? So, you? the only other thing I've got that's not relating to the music is uh, Frollo, great Disney villain. Oh, he is great, yeah, proper he's evil, yeah. proper evil. There's bits in it that are like, like you say, he's be- he thinks he's bewitched by Esmeralda. The favorite bit, which I hadn't noticed before, is obviously when he's he has this song Hellfire in front of in front of the fireplace, and mm. it's like all comes out as if she's bewitching him in flames. And the next day he gets out of a carriage. And I I went to my other half and we watched, I was like, is he hung over? Is well, like is is the yeah. hint that he's sort of because he's of everything he's feeling, he's sort of drank a bit too much red wine or something and then he's hung over because why else would he look like that so i thought mm-hmm. that was really interesting uh, also second disney animated film we've done i think or sec- it definitely it must be the second one isn't it what other animated films we've done that aren't so there's not all dogs go to heaven so, that's not disney no and we did el dorado which is dreamworks no. uh we did do robin hood so we oh did yeah robin hood yeah and so third so th- do you know what third <laughs> third disney animated film we've done third ginger lead it is, yeah. I was, thinking, I was thinking, I was thinking, oh, just like Hercules, yeah, and very Robin ginger, but yeah, Robin Hood, of course, of course. And that's so we've, we've we've got a niche there. So yeah, that's about it for me from the likes. <laughs> we'll move on now then to talking about anything that we didn't like about the film, or perhaps anything that we would change. So go ahead, Josh. I know you like it, but I know you're also a balanced man. I am uh, a man of so, balance. So give it to me. What have you got? So a couple of bits. So so I've already touched on this, but I will um, go into it now. It's probably a bit dark. It's pro- there are bits where thematically, it's a, yeah. yeah, I think it, yeah, not physically. I think it's I think there are bits <laughs> in it where it might be a bit too scary for little little kids. If I was okay. if I was a parent, I'm not sure I'd be watching this with kids under eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know. But the, you know, there are bits where, for example, Frollo is clearly having someone tortured. Right, yeah. You know, and you can hear the whips and the screams in the background or mm-hmm. where, the, you know, the bit where they pelt Quasimodo with fruit. I remember yeah. being quite scared of that. So when it's this sad, came out, I would... That's when really it, sad. It's really sad, but when this came out, I'd have been five or six. And I think I did go to see it at the cinema. Mm. So it must be a U or a PG. Well, it's, it's not 12, is it? So it must be a PG at the, at the most. Mm. But I remember that bit really scaring me. And I also remember the bit where Frollo falls off the cathedral being terrified of that bit because when he stands yeah, yeah. up with the dagger he's all sort of yellow and red eyed and it's mm. really like scary so you know can I imagine watching this with my three year old niece no probably not could I mm. imagine watching it with a, an eight year old yeah probably do you know what I mean mm-hmm. I, I've got another niece who's, who's about about that age and I think she would probably be okay with it but it, I think it probably is a little a little bit dark and I wonder if that's why people aren't seeking it out now I think people are just putting it on and going, oh, actually. So I wonder if you maybe will see a resurgence of this in another five years. Mm-hmm. You know, something like that. Um, so so that was one thing. Um, I suppose one bit I never noticed, the goat's got an earring, which means at some point they pierced the goat's ears. Unless it willingly well, had its ears pierced by... Well, I, I, <laughs> I did notice that also. But, you know, very often you see sheep and cattle mm. and goats with that, that It might also not be pierced. Been... It could just be a clip. I think it's definitely pierced. <laughs> Come on, but it looks like the, they. It, it was. I thought it was quite funny because it reminded me of those tags that yeah, you give the livestock, sheep, the sheep, sheep but then it's, cows it's like it's his own style because it's a gold ring. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I suppose so. And the other, I suppose the other <laughs> question is, as is, again, it comes a little bit back to representation, which is, and I'm going to try to tread carefully how I speak here, but 
how, I don't know how I would, if I was a gypsy, I don't know how I would feel about this film because on the one hand, they are the protagonists and they're shown to be persecuted. But on the mm-hmm. other hand, there are some sort of stereotypes in there a little bit in terms mm-hmm. of how they behave. So not sure. It was just a point I thought was worth saying. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So uh, that's about it from me. So so I suppose what 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 do you make of that? And also what else do you have to add to it? Um, yeah, I hadn't really considered the things that you said. I think sort of throughout history, Disney has been full of quite dodgy stereotypes and stuff and you just sort of you just kind of accept it a little bit (laughs) now you know you see that they're making positive change and that you know they're trying to be kind of more thoughtful in the way that they uh present characters to us and stuff and that's you know that's all we can do is grow and learn from our past mistakes so but interested just to follow on from that interested Mm. no no historical marker on this what what a thing that says so if you say well if you watch dumbo right it says this contains outdated stereotypes. Oh, does it say reflective that? Reflective yeah. of the time. So it's one of the things I think Disney have got right, mm. which is not... Some stuff, obviously, they don't, they've not even put on Disney+. Plus. So, for example, last I checked, as far as I know, you cannot get Songs of the South. Right. Which is, a, okay, which is obviously yeah, yeah, one yeah. that's horrendously outdated and racist. Yeah. But yeah. you can get Dumbo, which has mm-hmm. the Jim Crows in it, which obviously it carries with it all the connotations and all the representation and all the issues. But I believe before it, there is a just there's a historical and accuracy warning. So there's a, you know, this is was made at a certain time, outdated, blah blah blah. But there yeah. isn't on this. Um, yeah, might be because no one's raised it, or I don't know. But anyway, yeah, back maybe. to what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah, maybe uh, no one has has sort of felt. Or maybe I'm negative, just maybe I'm wanted... raising a point that's just not there because they are the protagonists maybe. and they are shown yeah. to be persecuted. So, but I don't know. But anyway, back to what you were saying. Sorry. Uh, so the main thing for me is that some of the songs are a bit clunky in this, and they don't strike me as the type of song that you can really sing along to. Like some of the lines felt like they just had a few too many syllables in them, and the rhythm and the melodies weren't as smooth or as catchy as many other Disney uh, films. Like I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to sing back to you any of the songs or even hum any of the tunes or anything. And they didn't really have any lasting impact on me at all. Mm. Like they just felt, I don't know, it just kind of felt a bit clunky and like they just didn't really flow that nice. I think I, 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 I can see how someone would, would take that away because the, it's a lot more operatic and a lot more ballady than, say, The Lion King or The Little Mermaid, you know, a lot of people, I know I certainly do it with my friends or family, where you might, if you had a couple of drinks, or even if you just sing along to music generally, if you put on a Kuna Matata, people are going to sing along. If you put on Kiss the Girl or Part of Your World or um, Be Our Guest, all that, people mm. are going to sing along. You're probably not putting Heaven's Light or The Bells of Notre Dame on your party playlist, are you? Mm. Because they are very bleak. I like them. Mm-hmm. But I like them because they sit really well in the world of the film. So it's actually the same composer. It's Alan Menken. So it's the yes. same composer as Hercules, same composer mm-hmm. as Little Shop of Horrors. Um, now and, that has some catchy tunes yeah, in it, yeah. right? <laughs> so, yeah. So, so it's very emotive. The music's very dramatic and bold and emotive. And I do like it, but I will actually, it's a, I will take your point that it's not sing-alongable. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I, I do have couple of songs on my like sort of playlist if you will but it's because mm. i like them so i really like the song out there which is the one he sings about um you know if i could spend one day out there mm-hmm. i like that song and i also like the opening song because of the way it sort of introduces you into the story that you know the one that club and sings that's about the bells of notre dame mm-hmm. but i do take what you mean there's no big pop the only the, the, the only upbeat song that you sort of sing along to is the gargoyles one and honestly i can't I couldn't really recite any lines from it. Yeah. So I will I will take that. I like it, but I will take on board that you could absolutely feel that. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Not uh, any, for everyone. No, anything else? So the, the other thing, and this is such a general point, and I can't even explain it properly, which I'm not happy about because obviously I like to come here with a solid argument, but maybe you can help me with this. I don't know. But I just, I didn't feel that emotional wallop that I do feel with a lot of other Disney films. So I didn't feel particularly emotionally invested. And there was the odd time where I found myself wishing that I was just watching Beauty and the Beast instead. (laughs) So maybe 
This does have something to do with the fact that I didn't connect with the songs because obviously that's where a lot of the emotion and a lot of the feeling would usually come from in a Disney film. So if they weren't hitting me in the gut, then maybe it's unlikely that I'm going to feel that way towards the film. But There was just something missing for me. And I wonder, thinking about it, I wonder if it's maybe because Quasimodo's, his, his relationship with Esmeralda isn't the big love story maybe like that's yeah. not the thing like the emotional thing in robin hood is that robin hood and maid marion love each other so much and it oh my god it's so romantic that's so yeah, yeah. yeah exactly exactly whereas in this it was like it's unrequited love and then the other guy's getting in on it and it's just mm. a bit like it's more about learning know. to love yourself as well a little bit isn't it yeah maybe that just maybe so, i just don't connect with no, that because i hate myself <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. You've never felt love. That's what it exactly. is. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't get it. No, no. I, I, everyone has different reactions. There mm. are moments I've seen in films that people say, you know, this will make you cry, and I've never cried. I think it's just mm. personal, personal reaction. This film makes me cry, so I still cry Does at it, least, yeah. um, at least twice, probably Aww. in it. So the bit where he's holding above his head, screaming "Sanctuary," gets me mm. every time, and the mm. bit where the little girl gives him a hug at the end. That mm-hmm. gets me every time, but it might just be because. And also, I saw it when I was a kid. Yeah, you've so got there's, that a, there's, there's that nostalgic yeah. link for me as well, which mm-hmm. you, which you don't have. So mm-hmm. it, I don't know because you were quite emotional over. Was it Free Willy you were quite emotional over? Whereas Free I Willy, was just I cried like, nearly all the way through. Uh, Robin Robin Hood, I I burst into tears as soon as the first song started playing, like and Robin I pretty Hood much didn't stop. Time, not, yeah, <laughs> and not because that's particularly emotional, but for for me, it's the it's the nost- the weight of the so nostalgia. So maybe that, yeah, that, maybe yeah. that nostalgia is just not there for you. Yeah. Um, in the same way that other ones are for, from each other and stuff. So, it's it's one of them, and everyone has different reactions to stuff, which is what's so great about films. But no, for me, I have a, I have a, a very very emotive reaction to this film. So so, it's obviously just down to personal reaction. Okay, so we'll move on to talking about the critical reception very shortly. But I believe, Alice, you've got a little treat for us, taking us down the gargoyle hole. <laughs> almost, almost. Yeah. Maybe the goat hole. Yeah, the goat hole. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Josh and listeners. We are going to go down the rabbit hole for this segment that we're going to call Alice Down the Rabbit Hole. So... <gasps> For this segment of Alice Down the Rabbit Hole, we're going to start with a woman who contributed additional voices to The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's Debbie Derryberry. And yes, I did choose her because her name is so fun to say. Debbie Derryberry was born in California in the 60s. She is of Hungarian Jewish descent and her grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Debbie has provided her voice to a massive amount of films, TV shows and video games over her career. And she is probably best known for voicing Jimmy Neutron. But my favourite of all the credits she possesses is that as a stunt double for Jesse in Free Willy. Away from the screen, well, she is also an author, having written a book for aspiring voiceover artists called How to Succeed as a Voice Actor, VoiceOver 101. And she's quite passionate about animal rights, having hosted a fundraiser for the benefit of orangutans as an endangered species in her North Hollywood home. On the horizon for Debbie, well, she's currently working on animated TV show Grubs with Jerry O'Connell and Will Wheaton. And that was Alice Down the Rabbit Hole. Whew. What a very career. A stunt Indeed. double for a little boy and a I voice. Know. <laughs> I know. I was I, um, thrilled when I found out that piece of trivia. Debbie Derryberry, is it? Debbie Derryberry. So I also so that that strikes a chord with me as well because my nickname, one of my nicknames at school was, was Jimmy Neutron. I feel like either you've told me that before like that or that before. just feels so right. Yeah. It just feels so right. It's because it was one of those things that it actually changed. So I was in all the top sets. Don't want to, you know, don't want to brag. But I was, <laughs> and then um, I was on the football team. So mm. I was the only one in the top sets of the football team. So one of them started calling me Jimmy Neutron, boy genius, even though he was probably in the set below me. Yeah. Um, or whatever. Um, and then it changed over the years. So in year seven, it was that. And by sort of year 11, it was Jimmy Neutron. You've got a big head like Jimmy Neutron. Oh my god! <laughs> so either they forgot. The yeah, yeah. School was fun. You know, it's, it was fun. Uh, yeah. Rather have been locked in Notre Dame. So we'll move on to talking about the critical reception. Then, so obviously you were sort of lukewarm on this. So what's a lukewarm score for you then? Are we talking a a five, a six? I don't. I feel like Lower. a five would be no. That's too harsh. I f- I feel like a five would be too harsh, really, mm. because of the things that I did enjoy about it. Like Esmeralda is a trailblazer, 
and mm. some of the visuals in this I thought were really good. So mm. the strong elements of it are very strong. I'd maybe give it like a low six, so maybe like a 62 or a 6.2. Mm. Okay. What do okay. I think it got? You picked it because you thought it was a little bit underrated, but you really like it. So I wonder if it mm. got more like a high six, maybe a high six, maybe the highest of sixes. So I'll go with a 69 or a 6.9. Okay. All okay. right. Well, yeah. Well, you, do you know what? You, you, you're not far wrong. So at the time okay. of recording, uh, this is, and these are the most consistent scores I think we've ever possibly That's had. That's interesting. So on IMDb, it gets seven, but a flat seven out of 10. Mm -hmm. And over on Rotten Tomatoes, the audience give it 70%. Well, yeah. And the critics give it 71%. Gosh. So it averages man. out, a, you know, it's a 7 out of 10 film or a 70% yeah. film, whatever you want to call it. So for me, you know, I, I, I'm i not saying, I don't think it's a 10 out of 10 film. I'd probably give it maybe a 7.5 to an 8. So I think that's a little bit underrated. Mm -hmm. But obviously, that's above your score. So, so what do we think? Are we putting this one to the listeners? I don't, I don't know. You've made such a, I feel like you've made a really compelling argument. Thank and you. Your, your emotional connection to the film is quite convincing. And I mm. did only say that I thought it got a 69, but then I would give it. So I think for me personally, it is a tiny bit overrated, mm. but I think I am the outlier there. And I think if I'd seen it when I was a kid, I do think the nostalgia would have done some of the heavy lifting and maybe boosted that up a bit. Okay. So I am certainly prepared and would be happy to allow this to go into the underrated vault into the underrated without vault. a fight. And yeah. and do you think, what do you think of what I said about how people aren't seeking it out now? Would you say that's a fair shout or do you think? I think, yeah, I think when you think, like you listed them at the beginning, but there are certain Disney films that feel just like ingrained into the zeitgeist and into culture and that you just hear about all the time or they're referenced or all the songs are super familiar and everyone knows what you're talking about. And I feel like this isn't one of them. Mm. So in that regard, I it com and certainly compared to other Disney films, I would, I would say it's probably a bit underseen. So underrated and underseen? There you go. You did it. That's the right move for this podcast. <laughs> So there we go. The Disney's version of Hunchback of Notre Dame is underrated, just about, and underseen as well. So get in touch if uh, you have any thoughts on the film. We'd like to hear them. It is uh, one of my favourite times now. It's time to pick another film, and it's Alice's turn. So, Alice, mm -hmm. what are we watching and talking about next week? So for next week, we are going to be watching I, Tonya. I, Tonya, with Margot mm -hmm. Robbie. Mm-hmm. Okay, the interesting. The very same. Interesting. Okay, well, join us next week when we will be watching, digesting, and talking about I, Tonya. In the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, it's filmsandthatpod at gmail.com. We're on all the social medias if you just search for Just Films and That, uh, wherever you get your social media, really, uh, and you'll find us on there. We are also on the television as well, aren't we, Alice? We are indeed. Every Friday from 6pm, you can catch us on the local TV network talking about all our favourite underrated and underseen films. So if you live in Birmingham, Bristol, Leeds, Liverpool or the northeast of England, you can find us on Channel 7 on Freeview. Or if you live in North Wales or South Wales, you can find us on Channel 8 on Freeview. I'm also uploading all the little episodes onto Daily Motion. So if you head on over there, type in just films and that, you'll be able to see exactly what it is that we're up to. Yes, lots of ways to see us, hear us, get in touch with us and follow us and all that sort of stuff. But thank you very much for listening. And all that remains to be said is we'll see you next week for I, Tonya. Goodbye from me. Cheerio. Bye. <laughs>